Good morning. Hi, I'm Dennis Sack from Olson Engineering, and uh, welcome to the next one of our series of webinars. Today's webinar is on non-destructive evaluation of tunnels, pipes, and conduits. I'll be presenting uh, this morning along with Larry Olson, the president and chief engineer of Olson Engineering. We'll uh, be swapping through about halfway through. At the end of the presentation, we'll, be, uh, we'll open it up for questions. And um, please ask your questions in the chat box. Uh, another note, the, uh, this presentation along with all of our other webinars are, will be available uh, in a few days uh, on our YouTube site. And we'll be sending out a link to that as well, or you can just email us. So with that being said, let's, uh, let's get moving here. We're going to be start talking about non-destructive evaluation again of tunnels, pipes, conduits, how to uh, evaluate condition for quality assurance and for forensic investigations. Um, just as a quick note, all of the non-destructive testing methods that we talk about are uh, available. You, you can look at uh, ACI 228.2 discusses the non-destructive test methods for evaluation of uh, concrete and structures. So let's jump right into uh, tunnel deterioration. And most of these apply to pipes and conduits as well. They just happen to be specific uh, examples from tunnels right now. So what kind of issues do you have in tunnels? Well, typically you have corrosion of rebar if there's water flowing in, moisture intrusion, of course, related to that corrosion, uh, any kind of debonding of shot creative of liners, of tile, of other types of material that's on the face of the tunnel liner. You can have some drainage system failure, certainly cracking of concrete. Other issues you might run into, uh, efflorescence, uh, white materials, little stalactites coming down, soda straws, et cetera. And efflorescence is related to moisture intrusion. That's a really common tunnel uh, issue is any kind of moisture intrusion. Uh, liner cracking related to that, rebar corrosion related to the moisture intrusion and leading to, of course, delamination as we discussed. Another issue with pipes and conduits and tunnels are voids behind the liner and even within the liner. One of the most common uh, issues we get asked about for um, outflow pipes in dams and other water con uh, conveyance structures is voiding behind the, uh, behind the structure because that voiding can lead to piping and actually failure of a dam, for instance. Uh, of course, there's debonding of tile, as I mentioned. In uh, erosion of the surface, that's more of an issue in uh, conduits and outflow pipes, but we've seen cases where several inches of concrete has been lost to erosion mechanisms. And we have some of the non-destructive testing techniques we use can measure the remaining concrete section of the uh, outflow pipe. Finally, there's deformations, deviations, and, and of course, chemical deterioration if there's some kind of chemical attack. So let's look at a couple more examples. This is what efflorescence or water leakage can look like when you get into really bad cases. You can get quite a bit of moisture intrusion. It can lead to uh, corrosion. It can lead to other damage in the liner, or it might not be particularly severe. So some of the non-destructive testing techniques can tell you how severe it is, where the cracks are, how deep they are, if there's horizontal cracks, other types of mechanisms going on, or other types of deterioration. Here's an example of cracking in a tunnel liner. Under that metal plate is actually a big hole. There's a void behind there, a spalled off concrete. This was uh, pretty severe. If you, can, if you can see, some of that efflorescence is reddish colored. That indicates there's corrosion of the rebar as well likely going on. So that's a pretty severe case of a, of a void and a spall in a tunnel liner. You can see cracks in the liner around it as well. Here's an example of delamination of shotcrete coming in a tunnel liner. And this is a uh, example, this is kind of interesting. This is in a pipe where a core hole was able to, to locate, we use non-destructive testing techniques to map out delaminations. And uh, this was a core hole and we can, you can see the delamination in the core itself. It, nothing, no damage visible on the surface of the pipe as you can see, but there's a pretty good crack back inside. This is an example from photogrammetry, which uh, Larry will be discussing later uh, this morning. 
photogrammetry is using um, high definition photography in very close space photos to come up with a high resolution large scale image and map out where features are that are visible. In this particular image, you can see the uh, rebar corrosion and spalling very clearly, and these can be mapped out at relatively high speeds. You can drive along, for instance, through a tunnel and take photographs at relatively high speed. But again, Larry will be talking about that later in more detail. One, one more example that's something we sometimes run into are problems in tunnels and pipes and conduits that were there right from the start. In this case, there's a, um, a wall void from an embedded timber in the, in the uh, concrete. And these are types of things that can lead to problems or, or not, but uh, they can be de de uh, detected by the various non-destructive techniques. So what techniques do we use? Well, ground penetrating radar, which is the first one I'll talk about in a minute, Sometimes infrared thermography, either handheld or vehicle mounted. I should note infrared, uh, we did a large, we were involved as a subject matter expert in a large uh, SHARP-2 federally funded uh, research project on uh, high-speed tunnel evaluation. And infrared was one of the techniques that we looked into. It turns out you need a very high resolution, pretty meaning very expensive infrared camera to do infrared thermography very effectively in a tunnel, just due to the very low temperature differentials inside a tunnel. Infrared needs a large differential between the liner itself and the air, for instance. And they're usually, if you're familiar with long tunnels, nearly the same temperature. So we won't really talk too much about infrared today. Uh, we'll be discussing impact echo, <clears throat> a little mention of impact echo scanning. Uh, we'll have a discussion of slab impulse response for uh, looking for voids behind tunnel liners and uh, concrete integrity. Spectral analysis of surface waves can also be used for uh, integrity and uh, looking at the integrity or the properties of the material behind the tunnel liner. We, the, we, there are also uh, corrosion assessment methods, resistivity, half cell, galvanostatic, which again, we're not gonna talk about today. They're not used too much in tunnels, but they are available. And then fo finally, photogrammetry. So let's jump right into the uh, first method, ground coupled, ground penetrating radar. There is also available, and has been done in tunnels, air coupled ground penetrating radar. Air coupled tends to be much less uh, penetration depth and uh, isn't as useful for things deeper into the, uh, behind the tunnel liner, for instance. So we've primarily concentrated on ground coupled, uh, ground penetrating radar for, uh, for assessment of tunnel, uh, tunnel liners and pipes. So GPR antenna with ground coupled is obviously in contact with the surface as you're pulsing and moving. And it uh, measures echoes from different features. For instance, a conduit from the rebar, or from uh, voids behind the tunnel liner. You plot the uh, data as waterfall plots that have depth versus distance, and you're me measuring the response due to electrical properties. Keep that in mind. GPR is not very good for locating things like cracks, thin cracks. It's because there's not a whole lot of electrical property change across a narrow crack. However, uh, it is useful for voids, and it's very useful for rebar mapping or finding steel sets or embedded timber things of that nature. So here's a quick overview of GPR uh, going across. This is across corrosion of rebar or high, uh, where there's high chlorides. So you can see a, chlor uh, a corroded rebar will result in a much lower strength echo from the, um, from the rebar itself. The rebars show up as these hyperbolas. This is uh, some secondary reflections. These are the primary ones. So here's some examples of using uh, 400 megahertz antenna, we're scanning a uh, tunnel liner, looking for voids behind the tunnel liner, as well as mapping out rebar and other features. Right now we're uh, scanning the sidewall. This can also be done overhead. Gets a little tiring, but uh, it, it works, works quite well. And in this particular tunnel, we were able to find areas where the concrete was very thin. There was areas where the, uh, there was voids behind the tunnel. Uh, uh, quite a few interesting features in, this, in, in some of these scans. Here's an example of a GPR scan from a, from a pipeline or a tunnel liner. So what you see here is these individual parabolas are the rebar. The depth from the zero point to the tops of the parabolas gives you the cover depth. 
So you can see in some places the rebar is relatively shallow, other places it's deeper. What's interesting is we have these additional reflections deeper, what we call bright spot reflectors. And those are typically indicative of voiding behind the liner or behind the pipe. So that's one of the things we're using GPR for. And as you can see, even though there is rebar, we can still detect voids behind the, uh, behind the liner as long as the rebar isn't too dense. Or if there's multiple mats of dense rebar, it gets more difficult. Another example showing the surface reflection. Here we have some rebar that's right up at the surface. So this is very, very, very shallow bar. And then we're, this is right at the end of a tunnel. So this is on the, one of the portal areas. Here you have some deeper bars, but these are right uh, at the portal, very, very different, uh, very shallow. Here's an example, another uh, GPR data example, locating voids. Um, first of all, these little blue circles, these are steel sets. And these were expected about every 10 feet in the tunnel. And they, uh, they showed up quite nicely and each of them produced a, a echo. But this echo back here, you see this large bright spot reflector. That's a likely void, very likely a void in the liner behind the, or behind the liner of the tunnel, probably from water flow or some other feature. Another, uh, this is an interesting example. This is from a concrete outflow pipe in a dam. You can see the liner rebar. At this point, there's a joint between two pipe sections. And they, uh, the reason we were called in is they knew they had water flowing in at some of these joints from uh, water flowing on, from the outside of the uh, outflow pipe into the pipe when it was empty. And doing GPR scanning, we were able to determine that there's apparently a pretty decent sized void behind the liner in the area of the joint. And so that was something of concern. You can also, by the way, use the GPR to, for 3D scanning if you wanted to map out the entire rebar mat. And this is an example of a rebar mat mapped out with 3D scanning showing the uh, both directions. It'll give you depth and the full rebar mat. We typically don't do 3D scanning for void location, but it's very useful for um, determining the complete rebar mat information. Some of the uh, advantages that it's, GPR is very accurate and repeatable. Um, it's, it's, and it's good for walls and roofs. Another advantage, it can look at the liner and, and also, as I noted, the soil and rock behind the liner. And the ground coupled compared to the air coupled, as I noted earlier, has much higher penetration depths. With low frequency antennas, we can sometimes see six, eight, 10 feet back into the soil and rock, depending on, of course, the nature of the soil and rock and the properties. It can also be used for rebar geometry, liner thickness, uh, embedded objects, et cetera. Note that it's not gonna be very effective at finding very thin voids. So typically half inch or thicker, depending on how deep it is. All right, so let's jump into uh, impact echo testing, another technique that's very commonly used on, line, on tunnel liners, et cetera. And we've done, uh, we've talked about impact echo in a number of our other webinars. If you've attended some of ours, you're probably familiar with the method, but I'll go through a quick overview of the impact echo method. It's an acoustic echo-based system, sort of like, think of it as sonar. We send compression waves into the concrete. They bounce off of the backside or from other features in the concrete and come, those echoes come back to a receiver right next to the impact. This particular photo is showing an impact echo scanner going up the wall of a uh, concrete wall, up a concrete wall. So with impact echo, you can measure concrete thickness as uh, pretty obviously. You can detect cracking that's parallel to your surface or sub-parallel. You can map out shallow delaminations. You can map out debonds, including debonding between, say, steel liners and concrete behind. And you can use it to locate voids in the concrete, such as a concrete liner in the concrete itself. Impact echo is not very useful for finding voids behind the liner. Typically, we use slab IR or ground penetrating radar for that. Some uh, quick uh, specs, ASTM, there is an ASTM standard for impact echo, although I should caution that that really only applies to measuring thickness of concrete. It's not uh, applicable for, for flaw detection or for forensic investigations. The ACI 228 is probably a better reference for use of impact echo for general evaluation of concrete condition. 
Quick overview, as we noted, you have the test head. It impacts, well, let's start over here where it's sound. It impacts, bounces off the backside, comes up to the receiver. We're measuring how long that takes or how what the frequency of the echoes is between the front and the back. In a flawed area that, uh, or a cracked area, it will echo much sooner, much quicker. So again, sound, shallow echo. These echoes bounce back and forth between the front and the back. We could, in theory, measure the time interval and get the depth, but it's very inaccurate and difficult because they're so short. So instead, we run it through a fast Fourier transform and get the frequency of the echoes. And that frequency peak is really easy to pick with very high resolution. And the impact echo equation is essentially depth equals velocity divided by two times that frequency peak. This beta factor modifies the velocity slightly, but for walls, it's near one, it's 0.96. So don't worry too much about it, but essentially depth is a function of velocity and that frequency peak. So we're measuring the frequency peak and that gives us how thick or how deep, how thick your wall is or how deep your crack is. Here's a um, handheld uh, pretty lower priced impact echo system, our uh, CTG2 system for measuring concrete thickness. You can see on the screen, here's the time domain impact, right? You would have a really hard time trying to pick out the uh, time to, the thickness from the time domain, but a really clear echo peak at 5.2 inches. And what does the impact echo de uh, detect? First of all, as noted right here, it does not detect the corrosion itself. It can uh, detect cracking from corrosion, however, like say along this line of cracks. So horizontal cracks, it can measure um, voids, honeycomb zones, because it changes the apparent thickness, you know, as you noted, clay balls. We've used impact echo for um, new, new tunnel liners for quality assurance, and uh, as well as for forensic, forensic investigations when there's something possibly going on or that just client wants to know what the condition of the concrete is. All right, let's get into a case study. There's me in my Tyvek suit uh, inside a precast concrete cylinder pipe. This uh, relatively high pressure pipe, I believe it was about 150 PSI uh, water carrying finished water uh, from a water treatment plant to a city. So this is a pretty high uh, pressure pipe, a very high, um, <laughs> very important pipe. And uh, they had a major blowout on this pipe. The uh, flooded an apartment complex, steel pieces were up in a tree. Uh, it was a pretty major uh, failure of a one piece of uh, part of this precast concrete cylinder pipe, typically caused by corrosion of the pre-stress wires that are wrapped around the, uh, the pipe core. And then once, those once enough wires corrode, the pipe fails under pressure. So here's the typical cross-section of a precast concrete cylinder pipe, not showing the cylinder itself. Right about here, there's gonna be an embedded steel cylinder. So you have a core of concrete, embedded steel cylinder, more concrete, and wrapped around that core are pre-stress wires, very, very highly stressed um, wires that are can be subject to corrosion. Outside the wires protecting them is about a one inch grout layer. Well, when these wires corrode, it delaminates the grout layer. Well, guess what, what that lets us do? From the inside, we can do impact echo testing. So the full thickness here indicates sound conditions. If you've lost about an inch, that means you've lost your grout layer and you have corroded wires. So we can go in and do that impact echo testing. This is results from a sound location. I'm gonna show you really quick two slides this is sound, this is delaminated. Look at this top plot. You can see the waveforms are basically the same looking, the time domain plots between this one and that one. However, down here in the spectral plot, 11,100 Hertz corresponds to about six and a half inches, which is the nominal expected thickness of this pipe. In the delaminated area, we get 5.3 inches. So even though the time domains look nearly the same, there's a very clear difference in the frequency spectra and in the apparent thickness. This one is about one inch less thick than the other. And in those areas, you get this kind of effect. <laughs> 
you dig up the pipe and this is what happens when your pipe and this is a uh, this is one that hadn't blown out yet but it's just about ready to so uh, this is actually a different uh, different pipe but it's the same same type of uh, testing that was done and so this is a uh, the type of spalling and cor from corrosion of the pre of the uh, pre-stress wires that you can get in precast concrete cylinder pipe Show you a quick uh, overview. You can also, instead of as opposed to the point by point testing I, uh, you saw me doing in that pipe, you can also do rolling scanning. <clears throat> and we use a solenoid with multiple uh, receivers. The solenoid impacts as the receiver, uh, this round receiver rolls. And we can do tests about every inch along a, uh, a line and generate 2D, 3D plots of impact echo results. That is a quick example. Down here is a 3D plot showing. Uh, vertical height, horizontal distance, and the third dimension being color as corresponds to thickness. Over here, we have a uh, delamination on the backside of this concrete member. Over here, we have sound concrete, and here we have voided uh, concrete, actually pre-stressed ducts. And it shows up quite well in the, uh, in the slide. So another application of impact echo. There's Larry Olson, who will be talking to you folks uh, shortly doing a test inside a steel lined concrete outlet dam or a dam outlet conduit, looking for um, thickness and integrity. He's using in this case, instead of the built-in impactor, he's using a 0.2 pound hammer and our normal test head. So we're looking for debonded steel uh, liner areas, areas where there might be voiding in the concrete. This is supposed to be a steel liner with solid concrete behind it bonded to the uh, steel. So this is an example of sound location. You have a beautiful 25.7 inch thick echo. The time domain uh, signal, see a nice, you see the uh, response to the impact. It damps out very quickly. And you have a lovely frequency peak, single peak at 25.7, uh, corresponding to 25.7 hertz, or 25.7 inches. It's around, say, 3,000 hertz or so. So that's what we would expect to see in a, a sound location. With, and we're just measuring the total thickness of the concrete behind the steel liner. And keep in mind, we're doing this through the steel. So impact echo can work through steel just fine. And we've done some other research indicating that as well. However, in a location where there's a void behind the liner, the steel liner, notice the difference in the uh, time domain echo. That thing rings and rings and rings. Works really nicely. And you have a very low frequency response. This is actually the flexural response of that steel liner with an apparent thickness of 68 inches, but it was very clear that this is a void. In between those two situations, we have the case where the concrete liner is cracked. You can see it's not voided. We have a nice response, but we have a double peak. So we have the thickness echo at 28 inches and a tight crack echo at about 15 inches, 14.8 inches. So these are some of the things you can do with impact echo. At this point, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Larry and he'll pick up, uh, pick up the presentation from here. So thank you for your attention and uh, here's Larry. Thank you, Jeff. Good morning, all. I appreciate everybody joining us. Thank you very much, Dennis, for uh, doing the first half of the presentation. And as Dennis mentioned, we'll have an opportunity for questions at the end. So I thought I would just show my face briefly, uh, and then I will stop my video and go back to just the slides themselves. So as Dennis has already discussed, impact echo testing can be used to evaluate outflow works in pipes uh, conduits in various ways is if you can get inside it, you can test it. Uh, we could even automate some things if it's extremely small for testing. But nonetheless, um, generally you have to have confined space training, be in there with the proper uh, equipment, and you can do the various tests, for, primarily for thickness and integrity. So when you have a situation where it's a steel pipe lined with concrete on the outside, as Dennis was talking about, you can do ultrasonic thickness testing, more conventional, for checking for the corrosion or flaws in the steel. And this just shows the basic five megahertz probe coupled with an ultrasonic gel. 
And on the right, you can see the full section thickness echo and versus a corroded section on the inside, how much steel has been lost to make a basic comparison. Now there's always some variation in the manufacturing of steel and how much the normal range of thickness would be. So it's important to determine that and compare the ultrasonic results with it to decide if it's simply a manufacturing variation or true corrosion. So on, the, on that uh, steel pipelined concrete conduit on a dam, the Dennis was talking about earlier, we also checked the steel to see if there was any significant corrosion. It generally came in, in an acceptable range of thickness, although you can see it ranged a lot from 0.34 to 0.52 inches, typically around four tenths of an inch thick. When you zoom in on it, and this is just a screenshot, a little hard to get a good picture, but those are the multiple echo peaks on this ultrasonic flaw detector instrument. And they're spaced evenly, and they correspond in this case to uh, 0 0.437 inches, inch in thickness. So many echo peaks. Uh, so that's a simple approach, but an effective one. It's always nice, you can get simpler ultrasonic thickness gauges, but it's always nice to see actual echoes that you're analyzing. And it's more of a flaw detector. So slab impulse response. Uh, Dennis mentioned this earlier. This is a complementary to ground penetrating radar for looking for void in the subgrade to concrete contact condition. It's sensitive to very thin voids as an advantage. So you can evaluate subgrade support with it in tunnels, pipes, and conduits. Uh, you can also use it somewhat structurally. It's not necessarily always as sensitive uh, to depths of honeycombing and cracking, but you can see in a structural sense, is it a weaker section? That's also mentioned in the ASTM standard for it. Uh, detection, of course, voids and grouting behind steel liners and till pipes. Uh, debonding of tile and concrete overlays on concrete liners. And, and as I mentioned, again, detecting subgrade void behind thinner concrete tunnel liners that are typically less than about 18 inches thickness. You, it gets to be more difficult when you're dominated by very thick concrete to evaluate the subgrade support. So this is a, a schematic of the method on the right showing the typically nominally three pound impulse hammer. It's an instrumented hammer that measures the impact force and a geophone can be used on a flat slab or we use a velocity transducer that's an integrated accelerometer to work on tunnel lines because geophones really are only designed to work when they're fairly close to flat. Uh, so you measure the force, you measure the vibration response. It's really a modal vibration test. Uh, as I mentioned, you can see about a foot and a half deep and the ASTM standard C1740 is given there for both uh, subgrade void evaluations and also for structural concrete evaluations. So simply put, it evaluates structural response where you hit close to your velocity transducer and you're measuring the dynamic flexibility, which is the inverse of stiffness in the mobility, which is velocity over force. And this is a mobility plot. And what it shows is over a frequency range, typically at least zero to 800 Hertz, uh, the stiffness is the low frequency part and the average mobility is also meaningful. If the mobility is a lot higher, that means you're getting a lot more vibration response per unit force, indicating comparatively poor support conditions, as you'll see in the examples. So if you had honeycomb, the ASTM standard documents that it'll show this type of plot where it's increasing versus a solid section. Voiding beneath the slab has a typically a low frequency peak, very high amplitude and an irregular response again on velocity over force versus frequency. So we have two systems for that. We use it in our Freedom Data PC with the Wilcoxon velocity transducer shown here, which we put a base plate on it and the geophone. Uh, for flat slabs. We use the Wilcoxon velocity transducer for testing tunnels and pipes because we're sort of testing at all angles and all directions, upside down, sideways, and it uh, does that just fine where the geophone is limited to flatter slabs. It can also be done with our NDE 360 and just a more portable, easy to carry through, which can be helpful in tunnel linings uh, because it's battery powered. One person can easily operate both the testing and taking the data. So this shows a picture of some slab impulse response testing, SIR testing in pre-stressed concrete cylinder pipe. And this was done for subgrade support evaluation. They had concerns about the degree of support of this pipe. You can see it's a fairly small pipe. Um, 
And here is testing overhead on the crown and the Freedom Data PC being used to take the data. It's still best in this situation. You would normally do it with two people for safety reasons and efficiency. So it's typically done with two people. So what do the test data look like? Well, on the left is the vibration response and velocity amplitude of inches per second to an impact. And you can see that pulse, it's damped out very quickly. The time domain signal shows about a 2,400 pound impulse force and it's only there for a couple of milliseconds. So it's a few thousandths of a second contact time. Then you process it typically with three impacts into the frequency domain. And what it amounts to is the flexibility plot is shown on the left and the red line across is coherence of the data. When it's near one, you have higher quality data and it's shown here uh, near one over most of the test range on the right for the mobility plot. So the flexibility is inches per pound force. Uh, we're, so we're measuring that at lower frequencies and analyzing it basically between 20 to 50 hertz is typical, maybe as high as 80 hertz. And what is that value? And it gives you a number of 1.37 to the minus seventh. Here's the average mobility. And it's fairly smooth, well damped, rising a bit, but nothing significant. This is an example of good subgrade support conditions on that PCCP pipe. By comparison, poor subgrade support conditions are very different. The ringing response, because it's just not damped out, it's not in good contact. It's just the concrete wall thickness that is responding to that, but no damping from being in good contact with the subgrade. Uh, the time domain signal is still similar, 2,000 pounds force. But you can see that now the mobility is significantly higher and more irregular, very irregular, not well damped, still decent coherence. And the flexibility is also higher, which means it's less stiff because the inverse of flexibility is stiffness. So here's an example of a result that showed contact. It was still in contact, but comparatively soft, less stiff subgrade conditions. And it's a very sharp rise higher mobility, relatively speaking, but not irregular. So there was contact, but a comparatively soft subgrade support condition. So it's always nice to have calibration. This particular project had one of the pipe segments that passed through a concrete fault. So this is naturally void. So we had a sense of seeing the poor support result when there was no contact because of this pipe section. So that's always useful if you can calibrate and get a sense of how poor is poor. And this is a very clear uh, indication of that that was used in the project. So it was plotted up for various sections of the pipe. You can see sound and pour. Sometimes there were questionable support. You can see a joint. Uh, but this just shows in the red and the green, mapping out using clock positions from zero to 12 o'clock, uh, testing every hour and a half in a sense around the pipe on the inside. So this was used to evaluate which sections of the pipe had poor support conditions and so that repairs could be done, improving the subgrade support around it. Uh, moving on to spectral analysis of surface waves, uh, SASW, this test was developed by uh, my professor, Ken Stokey and his students at the University of Texas at Austin back when I was in graduate school, in the geotechnical program there. And we've applied it not only to the ground, but also to pavements and, and to evaluating as documented in ACI 228.2R, evaluating structural concrete. So this shows the, you need an impact source. You have two receivers in a line as a minimum, uh, running it into the PC or the NDA360. And we can vary the spacing on that bar from six centimeters to 80 centimeters to go from shallow testing to deeper testing. But it should all be in a straight line. So what does it do? It measures velocity as a function of frequency and wavelength in a layered system. You get information with modeling about the layer thickness and elastic moduli. So the surface wave velocity relates to the concrete modulus by the elastic uh, constant relationships. And you assume a mass density and a Poisson's ratio typically. You use two receivers and a source. And again, this is documented in ACI 228.2R. So the applications in tunnels, pipes, and conduits could be Probable material damage from various causes could be alkali silica reaction, fire, freeze thaw, and other cracking processes. Uh, looking at material quality control and assurance of the concrete by measuring modulus, which can be related to strength with destructive testing on cylinders or beams or cores. Uh, velocity to the fourth power per ACI 228.1R uh, back in 1989 was first 
put forward as an approximate relationship, meaning Bossy fourth power is directly related to Young's modulus so squared is related to concrete strength. It's an indirect assessment of delamination and debonding. We've used that on uh, bridge decks, asphalt overlaid bridge decks to evaluate uh, the debonding of the asphalt versus a true delamination at the top or bottom steel. And it slows down in velocity there at those depths of that type of horizontal cracking or just separation. Uh, measure the depth of vertical cracks. We've done this and uh, basically velocity is plotted as a function of wavelength and the wavelength is approximately depth and it gets faster beyond the tip of the crack. And get the, the stiffness profile of liners as Dennis mentioned going say from concrete into if it's a rock type tunnel, what is the rock velocity? So here's some of the equipment again. Um, it's an acoustic method, a short wavelength sample, the shallow, portion of the concrete, longer wavelengths go deeper and about into the subgrade with greater spacings. And you can use small accelerometers as is shown here, a couple of them to get even larger spacing than you can do with this bar, which is 40 centimeter sections with that extension, it goes out to 80 centimeters. And velocity does equal frequency times wavelength. That's the fundamental physics of the surface wave test. So basically, uh, this just shows the same thing again, a little bit of a close up and showing the accelerometers. Plus, it can be run out of the NDE 360 or the Freedom Data PC. So, some example results uh, this shows a spacing of 30 centimeters, the time domain signals of time and voltage. The big spike is the surface wave energy, is when you impact the surface of the concrete, only 7% is compression wave energy, like is used in impact echo to resonantly echo, 26% is shear wave energy. And about two thirds, 67% is surface wave energy. And you can see the first receiver on the top, the second receiver on the bottom, there's a slight delay in time between this peak and this peak. And that's analyzed in the frequency domain in what's called a phase plot, it's called wrap phase. And basically at one wavelength, zero to minus 180 degrees in the lower plot, jumps up, it wraps back, that's at minus 360 degrees, that's a one wavelength lagging response of the far receiver relative to the close receiver. So simply put, if you pick off 2628 Hertz, you multiply it by the bar spacing in this case of 2.62 feet, you get 6,900 feet per second for that wavelength. And that becomes a dispersion curve, which is velocity versus wavelength. And this was very uniform, thick concrete showing a good result almost the same 6,900 feet per second with good coherence for most of the range from wavelengths of 0.8 to 5 feet. Closer spacings would be used if you wanted to check shallow. So having explained that, uh, this is just often used to evaluate shockcrete and tunnel liner conditions. There's an impact with a simple smaller ball peen hammer. The bar is in line being held in line with the impact. Uh, there I am testing again on that same steel pipe concrete conduit. And we were checking for voids as well as the concrete thickness integrity and the quality of the concrete versus depth on the project. And here's a result showing you can see the phase cycles, many phase cycles. You're getting a lot of high frequency energy because you're hitting steel into concrete and a good velocity result of about 7,300 feet per second on average going out to wavelengths of the thickness of nominally 2.6 feet. By comparison, where there was a problem with, as, in, as Dennis showed with impact echo testing of a ringing pipe and lack of contact, we saw this drop in velocity associated with that. So this is showing some definite uh, voiding conditions on the pipe to concrete interface. So deterioration modes can also be detected with the SASW testing, the depth of vertical cracks by testing transversely across the crack, hitting with the receiver on one side, the bar receiver on the other side and testing across, it will get faster once you go out beyond the tip of the crack. Assuming it's not cracked full depth, of course. Uh, you can find alkali silica reaction, delayed etronite formation damage because that's distributed cracking. Uh, you'll see that lower modulus material. Freeze thaw damage very similarly lower modulus material. When you get beyond that depth, it'll get faster again. And fire damage, same thing. It'll start to increase velocity 
as wavelengths get deeper into sound concrete. So you're measuring the concrete modulus from velocity. You can do wider spacings with modeling to get the modulus of subgrade material. Uh, look at debonding of overlays, tiles, top delaminations, deeper delaminations, and you get the fundamental surface wave velocity, which can be used to get you an impact echo compressional wave velocity. So all of this kind of ties together. We're often doing impact echo and surface waves testing together. So this is an example of combined impact echo and, and surface waves, SASW. Uh, this is impact echo for tunnel lining thickness and the surface waves were done for rock competency to check it on the outside. So it's difficult sometimes to get photographs <laughs> hidden tunnels without real lighting. You can see we're using headlamps, but this is impact echo over the head hard to see, but that surface wave testing on the side of the pipe running along the axis typically because of the curvature, you normally do it along the longitudinal axes, axes of the tunnel. And there's the freedom data PC to take the data. So, and, and this was just tall enough that we had to have a small step ladder to reach the crown. So it was kind of interesting because the tunnel boring machine had been used to put in this, uh, it was actually a, a tunnel, but it was a, used for water conduit. And the tunnel boring machine, of course, is cutting through so solid rock. We checked over this distance of 18,000 feet every so often to see the range of thicknesses. And these are both the crown, the spring line, all around the invert, all around the tunnel section. It varied a lot from as uh, thin as four inches to as thick as almost 26 inches. You know, so it, it just shows of course, with the rough cut rock, that you can get quite a range in concrete thickness. Surface waves showed a high concrete velocity, about 8,000 feet per second, with a small decrease in velocity at the rock interface, but then deeper, 7,200 feet per second. This is zero to 10,000 feet per second, wavelengths of zero to, in this case, almost four feet, 48 inches. Um, you can see that velocity plot variation, but good quality conditions, both in terms of the concrete and the rock. So the last topic of discussion is something we're using more and more when we wanna get very good surface images of the concrete we're testing. Uh, it's digital photogrammetry. The applications are collecting the baseline data for liner shape, uh, the current cracking, moisture efflorescence, any other surface flaws you see, any surface distress, you can compare over time if you're seeing changes in the surface degradation. And this is just an example of uh, how multiple photographs are taken. Uh, it's processed in a 3D sense, and it gives you the texture and geometry in a more vivid sense than just a straight single picture alone. So you get these so-called uh, DTMs, but 3D images, and you really do see the surface conditions. Obviously you need a high resolution digital camera, uh, although even a good cell phone camera can now do a good job uh, of producing images. If obviously you have to zoom, then you need a more sophisticated camera. So here's an example on a tunnel, the Eisenhower Johnson tunnel. Uh, this is looking at, can be done on an automated basis as you drive through the tunnel. Uh, this is, I believe, part of the SHARP-2 demonstration project for implementation assistance program that Dennis and I served for the SHARP-2 R06G study that was first done by Texas A&M University. We were involved in helping states, Colorado was one of them, Pennsylvania, Virginia, other states had some uh, implementation funding and we served as the in-house expert to talk about non-destructive valuation of tunnels and help them explore technologies in these DOTs. So you can look up SHARP-2 R06G to see this overall study and these methods we're talking about as well as some LIDAR and other uh, mapping methods, the infrared, et cetera. Um, so basically this just shows a high resolution image. You can only collect data that you can see, of course, you're going to need to take multiple angles and photographs, and you can have some issues with air temperature and pressure changes. If you're doing it at a non-uniform situation, then you have to correct for atmospheric effects. But here's some more images of the Eisenhower Johnson tunnel. Uh, you can see the cracking damage is quite vivid. Uh, the efflorescence that is there, the spalling in an area of the lining. You can see the exposed steel and some corrosion that has occurred in that area uh, that all show up. 
and here's another plot uh, of the cracking damage, uh, highlighted a bit to show it even more, but nonetheless, it does give you very nice surface images. And we're using that on decks and bridges and other structures as well. So just to summarize, um, we started with a slide like this. These are the applications of NDEs, unstructured valuation methods for tunnels, pipes, and conduits that we've been talking about today. Certainly ground coupled ground penetrating radars is best for mapping of steel and generally voids of a half inch or greater in thickness behind linings. As well as you can check for some moisture penetration as Dennis mentioned uh, with lower frequency antennas seeing deeper that are also uh, varying in the subgrade materials around a tunnel or a conduit. Handheld infrared thermography we did not talk about so much. Uh, it's limited without a heat source. We've had, if you've got a really good circulation of a big tunnel with a lot of fans and you can see daytime to nighttime temperature ranges, you might pick up something well with infrared. If not, you're not gonna see much beyond the entrance. It's most commonly done for tile debonding in some transportation tunnels that have tiles because that's a near surface test. And that was shown in the SHARP-2 study. Uh, impact echo, thickness mapping and concrete lining integrity. Uh, it's been well documented here. Uh, slab impulse response, complementary GPR for void because you can find thin subgrade voids of 16th of an inch or less. And so that can correlate quite well with the GPR and give you a lot of confidence that you do have a voiding problem. Working out to about 18 inches thick. Uh, surface waves, crack damage, crack depth, stress cracks, fire damage, concrete lining, subgrade quality velocity modulus evaluations. We didn't talk about corrosion methods, but if you have steel, electrical resistivity, half cell and galvanostatic pulse can all be used to characterize the corrosion activity, estimate the rate, and basically map out where it is corroding, uh, and the likelihood of corrosion potential. So photogrammetry, finally, uh, high resolution photographs of lining surface conditions. We have presented data now that has non-destructive evaluation data superimposed on these photographic images. That can be illustrative in terms of seeing the correlation of the NDE results evaluating the deeper internal concrete conditions as related to the visible surface conditions. So just, we started the company, I started the company in 1985. I'm very glad to say that Dennis joined us in September of 1990, he's been with us uh, ever since then. And so uh, we're moving ahead all the time in terms of imaging infrastructure for assessment, monitoring, repair with both non-destructive evaluation and geophysics. And we started developing equipment for ourselves in 1986, first cross hole sonic logging, got some interest from other people. So we formed Olson Instruments uh, as a division and then its own company, it's a subsidiary of engineering in 1993. And then we're making various instruments for that. So. With that, I wanna say very much on behalf of myself and Dennis, uh, thank you uh, for attending the uh, webinar today. And certainly look forward to answering your questions in the chat. Uh, Sterling will read those off and either Dennis or I will respond. The first question has two parts. Uh, are these able for steel pipe? And specifically, can we use any of these to detect flaws in the steel itself, or are these methods usually only helpful when there is concrete involved? Uh, yes. The, we, we've actually done some studies on that were applied research looking at nominally half inch thick steel plate with various flaws behind them. And the flaws were void, cracking, and honeycomb. So there's kind of a two pronged approach here. The ultrasonic thickness is a very good one as we showed for checking just the corrosion of the pipe itself, uh, but in the thickness of the pipe if that's unknown. And then if it's bonded, we can see deeper. Now, if it is debonded, you are going to have trouble. You have to have some contact. An impulse response can be used to uh, look at the general stiffness of the section. But again, if it's debonded, then you're not gonna see deeper. Truly debonded, I mean air gapped. Okay. We have another sort of two part question. What are the spacings of the data test points along the pipe circumference for each of these steps? And then we have a comment off of that that says, yes, I was also confused whether SASW was used as a fixed transducer spacing or variable. 
Well, to answer the first question, um, this all depends on what the project objectives are. If you've got a real concern over void cracking in honeycomb, you will do a much tighter grid uh, where you're maybe testing all 12 clock positions, if you will, around it. More typically, you might be testing four to eight clock positions. Uh, and then you'd have to decide how much longitudinally along the pipe, the conduit or the tunnel you need to test. That is typically a number that could be everywhere from uh, one foot in some critical pipes, right? And as Dennis pointed out, uh, the impact echo scanning can be done every inch if it's a smooth concrete surface. We do need a smooth concrete surface uh, to use the impact echo scanner. And it could be done on the, and is done on a steel pipe lining with concrete behind it. As long as it's bonded, that works quite well. But the scanner requires smooth concrete. If it is rough, it is not going to work. We have a different scanning approach we use on bridge decks that some of you may have seen where it's designed to deal with a rough concrete surface. So uh, I know there's not an exact answer to that. It does all depend as people don't like hearing, but you know, along a typical tunnel, maybe every 10 foot, maybe every 50 foot, it depends on if you see a lot of damage, you tighten the grid in that area. Otherwise you're kind of spot checking. And it was shown like every couple of hundred feet over, well, even longer than that on that one long 18,000 foot tunnel for thickness variation. They just wanted to characterize it as opposed to a specific damage concern. The second question is, the surface waves were presented often as a single spacing, which depending on what you're testing, you could sometimes do. But if it's really thick concrete, we would go with say maybe a 20 or 30 centimeter spacing, and then maybe an 80 centimeter spacing on the SASW bar, just to see deeper. So if it's thicker, a, a simple rule of thumb is the spacing of your bar should be less than or equal to, to start, the thickness of the lining in terms of the concrete. Okay, the next question is, when using digital photogrammetry, what technique are you using to measure your ground control points inside a tunnel? Well, I think it hasn't been super critical, but in terms of what you saw those images done on the Eisenhower Johnson tunnel, that is all tied into both GPS and distance wheels as they are going slowly through the tunnel. And Dennis was involved in that. Yeah, he did point out that you do, you need the, you know where the joints are. So you tie the joints in together because you're, you're quite correct. In photogrammetry, it's very important that you have a reference point, even on the surface, not only in terms of distance along it. Because when we've done it on some bridge joints and other interesting things like that, we definitely had a grid on there that we could tie them in and that's used by the processing in the software to make the images overlap in a simple sense correctly. Okay, next question is, were any of these techniques used to determine the horizontal voids outside tunnel, pipe, and voids in old mining areas that caused sinkholes? How accurate was the investigation results? Well, actually, uh, our principal geophysicist, uh, Dr. Ryan North, has done a lot of work on karst and sinkholes, but these particular techniques would not be necessarily the approach for finding that. And one other thing we should mention, it is very unusual with radar, say, to see the thickness of void outside of the tunnel because the energy is so attenuated by the reflection at that void, whether it's water filled or air filled. So we'll map the location, but destructive testing or exploration is normally needed if you want to get the thickness of the void. Uh, once in a while, we have seen top and bottoms of voids under slabs, but not such a high percentage of the time, probably less than 10%. Okay, next question. Can we get a copy of the presentation? Is there a PDH certificate for this presentation? We haven't yet gone to making PDHs. If, if, you're, if a number of you are interested in that, we feel like unfortunately we'd have to charge something because we have to get it formally approved. And so we haven't done that. Uh, but the whole presentation, not a copy of it, but it will be put up on the web, uh, both a link from our website under olsonengineering.com and it's under services and under training and then there's webinar listings. And that's one way to get to our YouTube channel to see that, I shouldn't call it a channel, our YouTube site <laughs> to do that. So if a bunch of you say, oh yeah, we, we'd be happy to pay a nominal fee for a PDH, we might consider it. But so far we've been doing them free and haven't been doing the PDHs. 
Okay, next question is, realizing you can't scan every square inch, briefly explain how you would go about performing a GPR survey of a large diameter 2,000 foot storm water tunnel with the objective of finding voids between the concrete liner and the sandstone bedrock. So is this 20 feet in diameter did I hear? It says 2,000 foot storm water tunnel doesn't say a diam a, a large diameter, 2,000 foot storm water tunnel. I would assume eight to 12, 12 feet. Yeah, I think that uh, we would scan longitudinally. We, if it's, depending on the diameter, it might be possible. You can do a radial scan, but mostly longitudinally yeah. looking for it. And depending on the thickness of the lining, either the nominally two gigahertz antennas, if it's really thick, maybe down to 900 or less on doing that. And we do some scans with dual frequency antennas even. So that is possible as well. And I think, uh, I think this question may have come from a gentleman that wrote me, uh, I saw it and I'll respond further. Okay, the next one is a comment. It just says, Larry, you've been consistent. I was at your ASCE 2014 training at Vegas. That's great. That's back when we could all travel. <laughs> but thanks for attending the training. Uh, it'll be interesting to see in this now Zoom world how much training is done in person in the future going forward by ASC, ACI, and others. But Dennis and I have both served as the structural condition assessment of existing structures, concrete in particular, and internationally I've taught on concrete and masonry, both teach on, and we've taught on the uh, steel, the metals, and also on wood when it's an international seminar. And also I've done some bridge condition assessment and performance monitoring seminars for ASCE. But uh, as we all know, hopefully the vaccinations get out there and we come to some new, new normal, which I bet is going to be a lot of video conferencing and some in person for when it's more important. I shouldn't say more important, more focused, longer time. Okay, the next question is, if using SASW to analyze fire damage, what depth resolution can be expected? Well, fairly good in the sense of, uh, with modeling, you can actually determine it. I'm gonna say half inch. Yeah, Dennis is thinking a half inch. We've both done a number of fire damage studies. And you get this velocity versus wavelength plot. And first thing you do is grid it out in terms of a grid. And you always test an area of similar identical concrete that was not exposed to the fire. So you know how good good is. And you also do some impact echo. It will be complementary in terms of comparing the two. But you will have to do modeling if you really wanna see the depth of the lower modules. Okay. Do you have methods that can evaluate underwater in pipes slash conduits? Yes and no. We have done underwater testing with impact echo surface waves and ultrasonic pulse velocity with divers on bridge piers, for example. So you can do it. The question is, how do you get in there to do it? And we can waterproof the equipment and have done so. So if, if you have a specific question, send Dennis and I an email and we're happy to talk about it. We can do some technological things, but it's always a question of access. And we have yet to see anybody use a remotely operated vehicle with our equipment came up once as a possibility, but it didn't happen. Okay, next question is, I'm interested in grouting assessment during installation of segmental linings. Since grout exhibits rather low acoustic impedance, is there any chance to recognize well-grouted gaps from void by using impact echo? Well, some in theory, it'll ring down differently because of Before grout would be thicker. But we're assuming you mean after the grout is hardened and has taken strength. Yeah, it works really well. We use slab IR for that. Slab IR, slab impulse response also works well for that. Yeah. And with impact echo, in a sense, you're trying to see a thicker echo, if you will. Thick is the grout, sorry. If, if the grout is substantial in thickness, you will see that difference clearly. But slab IR, as it was shown, even for that PCCP pipe, which is a perfectly uniform cross-section, but that was very sensitive to the outside subgrade support yeah. condition. Well, we've done a lot of slab IR on, on grouted steel pipes. Uh, that's very common. Actually. If you couldn't quite hear Dennis, he has pointed out that we've done slab IR on grouted steel pipes to see that they were in good yeah. support conditions. That, that the grout was complete. We're looking for voids in the grouting. 
quite a few of those. Okay. Next question is, what software do you use for photogrammetry? I knew that question would come up. <laughs> uh, while I've used photogrammetry and all that, I have not done it directly. We're going to ask Brian North and our other people who have used that software, and we will answer the question shortly because he's in the office. But it, it's interesting because a typical image will take on a fairly good computer, an office computer or a notebook, it'll take like three or four hours of runtime, but you start it, it runs and compiles your many images, and then you get this end result. So in a sense, it's very computer intensive, but you don't have to be there while that is being done. Okay, Ryan North just walked by. Uh, so Ryan, this is our webinar, and they asked what software you use for photogrammetry. And as I've only looked at your results and not used it, can you address that? Sure. So this is our principal geophysicist, Ryan North. He's given some of the other webinars and along with Travis Nielsen on geophysics. Sure, there's a, there's a whole range of software you can use for photogrammetry. All of the photogrammetry analysis is based on a paper from, I don't know, like 1973 on the structure from motion algorithm. It was originally written on how you could reconstruct um, from a fixed camera things around you, but basically it just reversed it. So it's, it's a linear algebra problem. The two most common photogrammetry softwares are what I use, which is from Agisoft. It used to be called PhotoScan. Now it's called Metashape. Um, so that's the tool that we use, um, but there are another, a, a number of other programs. So PIC 4D, PIX for the letter D is a very common one. Uh, it's, a, it's an entirely web-based system. It's a software as a service you pay every year for it. And then there's a version of it that is available from um, Esri, uh, who makes ArcGIS. And so it's, it's, it's just PIX4D with a different name on it and it runs inside of ArcGIS. There are other programs, Global Mapper, which is a, a sort of a light GIS program, has a photogrammetry processing tool in it. Um, I think both AutoCAD and Bentley actually have photogrammetry processing tools. And uh, Trimble has a, proto, a photogrammetry processing tool that's inside Trimble Business Center now. There are other options. There are free ones. There's WebODM, Open Drone Map, um, uh, which you pay like $100 for, which gives you a pre or GUI instead of running from the command line. And then there are other options as well. Okay, next question is, in an above ground water bearing structure that is empty, would impact echo be the best way to determine deterioration by detecting delamination? Yes, because you'll see the front and backside steel delaminations. One responds as kind of a flexural response that Dennis mentioned, and the other is a thin section echo. And you'll know the depth of the steel. I'm assuming it's thin, con it's smooth concrete because you mentioned it as a water retaining structure. So the impact echo scanner would work well. And that works from basically three, three and a half inches out to a couple feet, sometimes a little more. Yeah, if it's a large flat area, we have a sonic surface scanner we use on bridge decks that also automates the testing. Similar, but it's a much higher scale and that deals with rough concrete, rougher like a bridge deck. Okay, next question is, what is the ballpark cost for the different types of testing methods? Okay, I'll answer this in general sense. It depends on the complexity of the project and what we're doing. But, but for us, typical consulting, you have a project that if you spend a full day in the field, somebody provides a helper, you know, we send a person with equipment and equipment analysis and report, you're typically looking at not worrying about mobilization or travel costs, normally five to 6,000 per field day. And you'll get normally hundreds of tests results for that investment. So to say a per day cost more gym in any specific thing, it just doesn't work out that way. It's we quote, quote per project, but that's typical consulting. Do you integrate your findings to carry out cathodic protection for rebar corrosion control? We have not been providing the cathodic protection uh, design services. We're aware of it, certainly, but we do integrate it and it's part of what is done, particularly with some of the uh, corrosion rate methods too, that we talked about earlier, the galvapulse, half cell and resistivity and where the damage is, is looked at. So in that sense, yes. 
Okay, do you have any recommendations for NDT testing where riprap or large boulders and a glacial till might interfere with some methods? That's an interesting question. We have to get to the concrete or the steel. If we can't, if the glacial, I mean, all you can really do there in that situation, and it's difficult, is I suppose, depending on the surface, maybe radar could be done, but we definitely need to get to the surface. Okay, and it looks like the last question is, how do you manage these material surface roughness in these tunnels? They are pretty not smooth as usually explained away on paper. Yeah, the nature of our equipment is that the displacement transducers that we design and manufacture for the SASW bar and impact echo, normally you can find a point smooth enough to couple that. When it gets too rough, we're definitely doing point by point testing. Yeah, and and the in the sonic surface scanner, if you want to see that, it's I think on the engineering web page. But there's also when we talked about bridge evaluations last May, that webinar has the sonic surface scanner in it. So we have had some projects where we're doing ultrasonic testing. Then you definitely need some grinding if you have to do ultrasonic, if it's really rough. We didn't talk about pulse velocity today because that's a two-sided access test, which doesn't work well on tunnels and pipes, obviously. But uh, so the answer to your question is that has not been a huge issue. We definitely lose with the handheld scanner, you're not gonna scan a rough surface because that takes smooth concrete comparatively. It's, it can be a broom finish, that's not a problem. But, Yeah, the handheld ones, you can normally hunt out a spot where you can hit it and you just move it a little and you'll get a good result and you can recognize it, even with the solenoid impactor. Okay, we actually have two more oh, questions. I, I two more questions. We have two more questions. Yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, the next question is, in using the two impact echo equipment discussed, what is the advantage of using the single apparatus with an attached impact source and the one with the separate impact source and data recorder? Okay, the built-in solenoid impactor does a pretty good job of going from say echo depths of three to three and a half inches out to 12 to 18 inches depending. And at some point though, when it gets thicker, we will still use the same test head, but switch to a simple ball peen hammer using the round, end, round tip, the ball end of the hammer to excite it. And we have an option for the instrumented hammer if you really wanna compare strength of echoes, but that's not done so often. So, in the same test head, you can go from nominally three and a half inches out to about two meters in thickness, which is nominally 6.8 feet. So it's pretty good for most things. At some point, you switch to an accelerometer and a really big hammer, and you are using bigger hammers to see through 10 feet of concrete. An accelerometer can be integrated and go out to 10 feet or more, but you're losing resolution because it's about a 30 degree cone of sensitivity. So it takes bigger flaws to find them at depth in a big piece of concrete piece of concrete. Okay, this looks like the last question. Okay. Have you looked at surface dielectric measurements with an AC GPR to locate areas for more in-depth testing? I found it useful in cases. Okay, we're gonna get Ryan back in here. I think he's gonna say yes, but uh, Ryan has also done a lot of GPR as well as our other engineers and geophysicists. Yeah, if you might say this one. We'll see if Brian is quickly available to answer this in depth because uh, it's an interesting question. But the uh, certainly we do we've done on soils permittivity testing to get the GPR constants, in particular velocity and attenuation. Uh, so we've used that on some of our geophysics projects. Uh, so Ryan will probably be here in about ten seconds. His office is right next to our conference room. But I, I do, I'll just take the opportunity to thank everybody again for attending today and we'll let Ryan answer this question and then we'll wrap things up. So Ryan, they have a good GPR question for you. Okay, so. Okay, the question is, have you looked at surface dielectric measurements with an AC GPR to locate areas for more in-depth testing? I found it useful in cases. Um, I think what they're asking is, has have anyone, made measurements uh, with dielectric spectroscopy to measure the dielectric permittivity as a function of frequency and use that to improve their GPR results. 
if I'm incorrectly interpreting your question, please clarify. But yes, I've done that for 15 years. Um, so I, I, I do both lab and field measurements of uh, impedance spectroscopy, which uh, can also be called dielectric spectroscopy or complex resistivity or complex permittivity measurements. And I've used a whole range of tools, pretty much everything that's available and built a bunch of my own fixtures. So generally these measurements involve using uh, a network analyzer of some kind connected to a fixture. So a network analyzer is a tool typically used to characterize electrical networks, but it, it basically, it sends out a, a sine wave sweep. So you, you sweep through a range of frequencies and what you measure is the phase difference and the voltage amplitude difference that, are uh, that come back from your fixture. And so for concrete samples, the most common type of fixture is what's called an open-ended coaxial probe. I think there's one company that I'm aware of that makes this type of instrument for concrete measurements. And I can't remember what the name is off the top of my head specifically for that. But um, I have a number that were uh, made by companies like Spieg, which is Schmidt Partners something uh, limited in Switzerland and then ones that were made by Hewlett Packard, then uh, Agilent and Keysight as they changed names and ownership. And then I've built a number of different ones out of uh, coaxial airlines and ground planes. And then most of the measurements that I've done are typically with, again, HP, Agilent, Keysight, network analyzers connected to those. And then most recently I've been doing them with Copper Mountain Technologies, vector reflectometers, because they're small single port uh, network analyzers that are USB powered. So they're really portable for use in the field or on concrete. Uh, I, I hope that answered your question. And if I totally misinterpreted the question, please clarify. Uh, well, there's a follow-up comment that says, researchers looked at areas where there were peaks in the surface dielectric. One area had delamination with no surface distress. Any references, a page in the SHRP to R06G report on surface dielectric measurements along a tunnel lining? So uh, that's a little confusing in the sense that um, most uh, dielectric measurements that would be made on like a concrete or asphalt type surface um, are usually made with a fixture that's a reflectometer, uh, like, like I said, the open entity coaxial probe. And it's really only measuring the impedance contrast at the surface. They really aren't investigating very deep into the surface. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure, you're not really gonna see much from a delamination unless it's just extremely thin because it wouldn't be measured. Um, now you can extract, well, I mean, you can extract permittivity data from GPR data, if that's what they're doing, making a few assumptions. Um, and, and that's what people generally do if they make, uh, if they try to extract, for example, uh, water content or moisture content from GPR data, what they're really trying to do there is they're trying to pick the velocity, assume the material is non-magnetic from the velocity, then they could determine what the permittivity is. And then using the top equation, you can then take that permittivity and correlate it with moisture content if you make a couple more assumptions. So um, I think that's what you're referring to. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think maybe one of our future webinars will be looking at focusing on GPR and broad applications for that. So thank you, Ryan, for helping out today. And uh, we do thank everybody for attending and look forward to uh, your having a good, healthy, happy new year. May we all be vaccinated soon. Have a good day.